This is Glambition Radio, episode number 204, with Robbie Kelman Baxter, author of The Forever Transaction. Welcome to Glambition Radio. I am your host, Allie Brown. I'm an entrepreneur, mentor, investor, and mom of twins. I love thinking big, doing different, and exploring ideas that disrupt the status quo, especially when it comes to women, because we are rewriting the rules for leadership, business success, making money, and changing the world. And we're doing it with style. Let's go. I have a question for you. Isn't one of the first things you do when you look at your credit card statement every month, and especially in crazy times like these, looking at all the damn subscriptions you have, dinging your card. The model is thriving. It seems like everything's going to a subscription model. But right now is a really good time for the conversation we're about to have with Robbie Kelman Baxter. She's author of The Forever Transaction and The Membership Economy to talk about, you know, which programs like these really are thriving right now in this new economy. Because, you know, there's probably some that you took off and said, you know, we don't need this anymore. And there's some that you would never let go or you would flip out, right? How do you become one of those invaluable subscriptions to your clients, to your customers. That's going to be a great conversation today. Quick shout out to two great reviews that we spotted on iTunes. The first is Nicole Moline, Elevated and visionary, Allie's voice and presence has a weightiness among the conversations around women and entrepreneurship. I've discovered many inspiring leaders and businesses I'm happy to be introduced to through her interviews. These conversations always generate new ideas for my own business and a sense of community with like-hearted, ambitious women. Very well written, Nicole. Thank you. And Patricia Cordova, thought-provoking, classy, and down-to-earth. The conversations are real and honest, and I can usually pick up tips and mindsets that keep me moving in the right direction. The variety and caliber of women that are interviewed can't be topped. Thank you, Allie, for leading the way. I love these reviews. I read them. I cherish them. They let me know you're listening. We love to hear from you, by the way. I'm very active, especially on Instagram. Come follow me there. Comment on the shows. Write me. I will write you back. If you share the show, then we will give you a shout out. We want to create more engagement around the show because you ladies need to see who else is listening as well. So come join me there at Instagram. It's Allie Brown Official. And a reminder that our show today is sponsored by The Trust, the new private premier network for seven and eight figure women entrepreneurs. If you or another female leader you know is craving right now more powerful connections, more elevated conversation, and a modern platform for connecting with other high performing women globally, visit jointhetrust.org for more details. And to learn more about what we have planned for the rest of 2020 and 2021, when hopefully we'll be able to see each other and give each other hugs without hazmat suits. Get ready for a fantastic conversation with Robbie Kelman Baxter. Robbie, I would like to know where you are right now. I am in Menlo Park, California, uh, in my office. And... You guys have been locked up a bit. How are you handling it? I haven't put on shoes other than my Peloton trainers in two weeks. (laughs) I thought you were going to say, I haven't put on weight, (laughs) which probably (laughs) is because of the Peloton. (laughs) No, no. no, I mean, that's helping. But, you know, my my daughters are home from college and one of them is a phenomenal baker. Oh. So we have treats everywhere. Uh, You better be up in your classes online, (laughs) right? That's fantastic. Yeah. Oh, good. Well, so so good to connect. And we've we've been connected in a few ways. And that's always cool to see kind of the six degrees happen. So it's good to finally get you on the show. And, you know, we know your your whole thing is on the membership economy. Your next book is called that's coming out right now is called The Forever Transaction. You have an, a really interesting career though. And where I'd love you to start connecting the dots is how did this become your thing that you're known for now you're passionate about that you help companies strategize how to create these types of programs and offerings? You know, it's so, it's so funny, Ali, because when I look at other people 
that have areas of expertise, it always looks like they always knew what they were going to do. They identified it really early and they claimed it. And that's not exactly what happened with me. You know, it starts, you know, 18, 19 years ago now, uh, I got laid off when I was on maternity leave with my second child. And I decided at that point that I could not be dependent on a boss for my livelihood. And so I hung out my shingle as an independent consultant. And early on, I said, okay, I'm just going to do whatever I can do with my skill set that will pay the mortgage. But after a few months, I realized that if I really wanted to be successful as an independent consultant, I need to have an area of subject matter expertise. And I didn't, I didn't know what it was. And I was thinking, you know, I have to pick something that is, you know, focused enough that I can own it, that not everybody else is doing, but also something that I can be happy with for a long period of time that I won't get bored. And about my fifth, so I was thinking about this all the time as I was doing, you know, strategy consulting, marketing consulting, things that I, that I could credibly do. And then my fifth client was Netflix. And Hmm. I fell in love. I'd already, I'd already, I know you're a mom. I'd already fallen in love with Netflix as a customer Mm -hmm. because I always had three DVDs out at a time. And when I was up with my babies and my toddler, you know, I had something interesting to watch. I didn't have to go to the store. Remember being so excited when you go to the mailbox and your DVDs were there? And no late fees. Yeah. (laughs) Yes. It was amazing. And so then I I was asked to, to do some consulting at Netflix, which is, you know, based nearby. And I, fell in love with the business model, Allie. It was just so elegant and so customer centric, which I love. And it was so simple. They just said, you know, we're focusing on doing this one thing for our Mm -hmm. customers better than anyone else. They had this forever promise, professionally created video content delivered in the most efficient way possible with cost certainty. And you know, it's been interesting over the last 15 years, Netflix has changed a lot, right? They've gone from three DVDs out at a time, which we remember joyfully, to streaming, to creating their own content Mm -hmm. based on what they've learned about us, but they continue to deliver on that same promise. And when I was working with Netflix, what, what ended up happening is I thought the model was really cool, but other people thought it was cool too. And they started calling me and saying, hey, we heard that you were working with Netflix. We want to be the Netflix of whatever, you know, software, Donuts. hardware, Don't, totally <laughs> medical <Anything>. pain, man- <laughs> dental pain management products, bicycles. I mean, you wouldn't believe who was calling. And I said, okay, this mm. is really interesting. And I started trying to figure out what attributes were consistent across all of these businesses and what was unique to each industry or each business. And that's really where I came up with this idea of this membership economy. Yeah. When when did that first book come out? First book came out in um, 2015. So it took me 10 years from the time I first started taking notes on this concept till the day that it became published. Yeah. Yeah. Now, when this is interesting, because when you look at this concept, it, it's not new, right? This has been around since the Book of the Month Club, right? Like, it, like, yeah, like just 50 years ago, or yeah. you got the ranker, right? You know, selling yeah. whatever goop, and then you get the goop monthly and all that. What changed and has made this? Is it the digital age that has now made this such a thing? You know, just in the history, when you look at of subscription programs and continuity, you know, in your observations, you know, what is going on now? You're exactly right. People have always wanted to be members. They've always wanted to subscribe and have their problems solved forever. And you're right. Book of the Month Club, 100 years old. Guthy Ranker, you know, with Chaz Dean and When Hair Care and even Tony Robbins tapes were first through, mm-hmm. through Guthy, distributed through Guthy Ranker. Absolutely right. But what's happened is technology has extended the infrastructure that enables these trusted ongoing relationships. So mm. declining cost of storage declining cost of creating quality content and distributing it. Both of those things are much cheaper. You don't need a printing press anymore or a recording studio. And technology has grown to include a lot of options for subscription billing platforms and community platforms. So an entrepreneur today can get up and running with a membership in an afternoon. Mm -hmm. That's what's changed. Yeah. Yeah. So tell me, since writing the membership economy, you know, which is now about five years ago, and then your new book coming out, what has changed or what have you learned that you're now passing on to everybody with the forever transaction? 
Yeah. So five years ago, I wrote, <laughs> I wrote the membership economy as a one pound business card to explain how I saw the world because I felt like other people weren't understanding what I was seeing. So I would say to, let's say, a software company or a consumer products company or a retailer, hey, if you focus on the long-term goals and objectives of your customers and you optimize the benefits you provide them based on those goals instead of on your own product centricity, you will build greater loyalty, you will earn the right to ask for subscription revenue, mm. and you will be able to learn from their behavior, which will allow you to disruption proof your business. And they would say, I don't get it. I don't. I think that's really cool, but it's not relevant for my business. That doesn't work for fill in the blank. And so I wrote the book to say, look, this is happening right now. It's everywhere and it can work for you. Here's how. And then five years later, I don't have to explain to somebody that subscription revenue is a good thing. Every company, every mm. entrepreneur is trying to do subscription revenue right now. And what they're realizing is it's a little more complicated than just slapping a subscription price onto whatever products or services you already have kind of lying around. And in the forever transaction, I wanted to help organizations wherever they are in their maturity to build a subscription model that is going to stand the test of time. So it's divided into, you know, launch. So for entrepreneurs just getting started and for intrapreneurs inside large companies that have been tasked with building a subscription model and then through the scaling process. So that's the second section scale. And then for organizations that have had subscription models or membership models for a long time, how to avoid the pitfalls that have plagued some of the longer standing subscription and membership businesses so that you can remain in your leadership position. Mm. What are the mistakes though you're seeing that I'm sure, please do tell. <laughs> <laughs> oh, like, there's, like, there's are there so people many. like really try, I mean, and you know, probably larger, you can't name names that, or maybe there's public information, but like companies that have tried this and it just, they didn't do it right. Or they didn't go about it the right way. Or, you know, cause like you said, everyone thinks they can, they get excited. I see this at all levels with sometimes with the clients I'm working with, or, you know, in the headlines of the, the business section. Yeah, absolutely. So, so there's, there's a few mistakes. So one of the mistakes is you try one kind of subscription and it doesn't work. And you say subscription doesn't work for our industry. Like that kind of big, huge jumping to conclusions. You have to decide what you want your subscription model to do for your business. Is this a freemium model? Meaning some people get something for free forever and other people pay a premium forever. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to decide, is that what you're doing? Is your subscription something you're giving away for free? And if so, what's your return on investment? I see a lot of freemium models where Either the free offering is enough, and so there's no reason to pay, yeah. or you know where the freemium off offer is so small that it doesn't do anything for the premium model. It doesn't actually support the business. And I've seen models that don't deserve subscription pricing. So for example, this is sort of a funny one. A woman told me she was having trouble. She had a really great way for potty training kids. And she had an annual subscription and nobody was taking the annual subscription. They were only going monthly and they were only staying for two months. Can you guess why? Uh, yeah, because the, the kid <laughs> figured out how to poop on the can. <laughs> right, right. This isn't it's like a, a lifetime. I hope it's exactly. not. <laughs> exactly. I mean, you know, we would all be, you know, we're parents. It, it, the point's to move them happen. along, you know, and right. figure this out. Right. That's brilliant. And, and what, what her problem was is that she was focusing on her product, which was a way to do potty training instead of on her mm -hmm. customers forever promise, which is, you know, as a parent, I want to help my child meet and achieve her milestones throughout her, her childhood. So if this woman had taken, you know, the, the pooping on the potty as step one and then expanded the membership to go through all of the other things, you know, learning how to hold a pencil and learning how to, you know, what are the right rules and guidelines and, you know, how to get your kids to try new foods and all the other things that parents deal with. She might have had a, a real business model, but that's an issue with a lot of businesses that the offer itself does not align with forever and doesn't justify yeah. a subscription. And that's the kind of situation, if I can play with you for a minute, that she may just, you know, it, it may be so much work to try to design something around those lines that she should just keep retargeting 
parents with that issue? I mean, or do you think they're, that's where it depends on their mindset or what they want out of their business, I guess, right? Exactly. Exactly. You hit the nail on the head. I think, you know, if, if she said, look, I want to be in the, I want to be in the potty training business. That's all I like to do. I'm a solopreneur. I can do whatever I want as long as I achieve the goals that I want. Fine. There's no shame in being a transactional business and just doing one thing. Mm -hmm. And I, I could have lots of ideas of how to help her optimize that transactional business. But many, many entrepreneurs struggle with the fact that they spend so much time and money acquiring new customers mm -hmm. that it would be nice to be able to keep them for a while yeah. and build on the trust that you've already developed. Yeah. Yeah. Have you ever seen a business that this couldn't be done in, in some way? Yeah. In a very embarrassing way, you know, Vistage, the, the group that brings together CEOs for, for kind mm -hmm. of mastermind group, they had this big annual meeting. It was right after my book came out and they invited me to, to give the keynote. So it was like, you know, this big room with like 600 people. I gave my talk. And then afterwards, all these people came out to ask me questions and get the book signed and it was like one after another, that was where I really learned what businesses this doesn't work for, where they would say, hey, I own a fleet of fishing boats and every day our fishermen sell what they catch at the market on the dock for whatever the market prices are. How can we use a membership, right? So you can't because there's only one place you can sell it and there's only one price you can sell it at. And and so what I what I learned was Membership models, subscription pricing really works only when your customers have other choices besides what you have and where sales and marketing matters. And in the case with the fishermen, you know, they don't need sales and marketing. If they have fish in the boat, the market will buy them. And, you know, if they don't have fish, they won't buy them. And there's only one price. So, so membership models and subscription pricing do not work if or you don't need them. Let's put it that way. You mm -hmm. don't need membership if you have an advantage that is a, what, I, what I would call a non-market advantage. You have a patent. You have a geography advantage, like last gas for 100 miles. You know, who cares if your customers hate you? If you're the only game in town, they're going to buy from you. If you have the medication that they need, they're going to buy it from you. But in any other case, if, if you have an, and, and then of course, if there's only one time that you're ever going to do this transaction, like the, the potty training, mm -hmm wedding dresses, you know, you can't really have, you don't really want a subscription, you know, you don't want uh, rent the <laughs> runway for wedding dresses, right? Hopefully most of us don't want that. You just want to, you know, hopefully do it once. One funny, you know, story that not very many people know is that the founders of LinkedIn, before they founded LinkedIn, which I think is one of the best membership economy companies, they founded this other company called SocialNet, which was a dating site. And they were applying the same principles of, you know, building a forever transaction, really committing to the long term, really building trust. And the problem was that when you join a dating service, you don't want to stay forever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so they were building all this trust and then people were finding their soulmates and leaving. Yeah. Yeah. That's something they didn't really think about. <laughs> no. So they said the next time we start a company, we're going to give ourselves a longer runway. So, you know, they went with careers and, you know, most of us work in some way, you know, maybe from high school all the way through, you know, and we do it in different ways now, but people don't want to retire anymore, right? And some people can't retire. So it's, it might be a 50 year period that you might be on LinkedIn. Our kids, like my teenagers might be on LinkedIn for 50 years. Yeah. I think LinkedIn will be around as long as we're alive. And I've actually come to really like it. I'm on, I'm on the other ones, you know, because a lot of my followers are, but LinkedIn, is a great example of how they decided to, that that's something that everyone's using. It's helping them. I just launched a newsletter on there. I, I know you and I are connected on there. That's yeah. a great example of saying, okay, we do this really well, but this isn't the right market. How do we shift it? There's always another way to, to shift it. Uh, let's talk about retention for a bit. You know, I remember launching my first we, we called it continuity back when I was really into the information marketing. That was back probably gosh, I'm sorry. I had to like, you know, you know, you're getting older when you're like three, two, what you're counting backwards, <laughs> 2005, maybe I had like a $50 a month. We would mail out a CD of my teachings along with a print newsletter. We were just kind of reminiscing about how much we love print in the pre-chat and very quickly learned that these things can take off quickly, but then how much time you have to spend on retention. 
And retention is so much of the game for these things because it's it's not uncommon for people to get excited about a new thing. But then especially now look at a time, let's fast forward to a time like now, number one thing a lot of us are doing right now as consumers is going through that credit card bill going like all these damn subscriptions, which ones am I really using? Which ones are adding value? Let's talk about retention, I think in good times and bad, what we need to pay attention to. Yeah. So right now, I think we're in a period of tremendous subscription fatigue among consumers. That's a good way to put it. Yeah. In general, and, like even good times or bad, right? Yeah. Well, because there's so many, because, you know, as, as we discussed, almost every organization, big, small, public, private, just getting started, been around for a hundred years, everybody's doing subscription and a lot of them aren't doing it very well. So, you know, they're slapping a subscription price onto whatever products and services they've always sold or, they're giving, honestly, sometimes they're giving away so much that consumers have what I think of as subscription guilt. Like, you know, the New Yorker is the example people always give, like, oh, the articles are so good and it's such a good magazine, but I don't finish it. And then they just pile up and then yep. I feel so guilty. So I'm going to cancel. Mm -hmm. And that's in some ways you're like, well, that's not the New Yorker's fault that they're just so good and you can't keep up. But if the model results in people feeling overwhelmed and canceling, they have a problem. And then the third thing that causes subscription fatigue is hiding the cancel button. So back in the days of the continuity programs, what a lot of companies did to extend their retention is to make it really, really hard to cancel. Mm -hmm. um, there still are some them. out there, unfortunately. Yeah, I just, I just had it the other day. I was trying to cancel um, a software subscription that I had signed up for online. So you would think if you sign up online, you should be able to cancel online. They said I had to call. So I went to call. They said they were closed on the weekend. So this was like Friday at, Friday at 4 o'clock California time, which was after 5 o'clock Eastern time, which is when they closed. So I had to wait until Monday. And I'll just point out that I got billed on Sunday by them for the next month. <laughs> and then when I called Monday, I had to wait 35 minutes to talk to a person. And that's just unacceptable. And, and actually right now, you know, I, I spoke at a conference just this past fall and one of the, well, I was the keynote speaker on Tuesday and the keynote speaker on Wednesday was Leslie Fair from the Federal Trade Commission who kind of keeps an eye out on subscriptions. And she's very busy right now because so many subscriptions are unethical, mm -hmm. hiding the cancel button. So if you have a business where retention matters, like, like you discussed, you're a content provider or you have, you know, a subscription box or you have a monthly replenishment model or whatever it is, the most important thing that you can do is focus on engagement of your members. Onboard them for engagement and success. Be careful about who you acquire. Focus your acquisition strategies on people who are likely to stay. Mm -hmm. And then once somebody joins, remember that that moment of initial transaction is the starting line, not the finish line. So that's where you welcome them, you educate them, and you make sure, this is really important, you make sure that they're getting value for what they're paying for. Yep. So they're listening to the CD, they're reading the articles, they're calling in for the mastermind groups, because people who are engaging are less likely to cancel. Engagement is an early indicator of likelihood to cancel. Yeah. Yeah. I remember uh, one of my longtime older marketing mentors was a man named Dan Kennedy. And he is who I learned most of my direct marketing skills from and, and how back in the day, the continuity. And yeah. I remember him saying that, you know, people will leave sometimes if they're not using the content, but also I want to talk about community. And that is in many of our circles, the number one reason, as especially we're mentoring entrepreneurs, business owners, when they tap into like a specific type of community that's part of this membership or continuity, they don't want to leave. Do you find that is the same even with big companies or some maybe some niches we hadn't thought about? Yeah, absolutely. So, so here's what I would say about community as an element of a subscription model or a membership. In many, many cases, it can be a very powerful tactic, like offering freemium, like offering live events. It's a tactic. It doesn't work for every business, but mm -hmm. it can be incredibly powerful as a way of deepening the engagement and creating differentiated value that people don't want to give up. So it's members connecting with members and creating value under your brand's umbrella. So it's very unique. Yeah. Um, what, what people need to keep in mind, though, 
and I know you know this, is that you don't just buy a community platform and then unlock it and send out an email to everybody and say, it's here, go ahead. Yeah, have at it. Yeah. <laughs> Good luck to see you. What ha- let's see, what could go wrong? <laughs> yeah. you, you have to really yep. nurture it. You have to seed it with good content. Absolutely. You have to kind of back room, call your members and encourage them to post. You have to moderate for tone and culture, especially early on. So you don't, you know, so that you have a respectful, trustworthy group. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, that actually takes real effort. And eventually, you know, many of those models can kind of thrive on their own, but you do have to invest. And, you know, one really cool example of community, I think, is CrossFit, Church of the Holy CrossFit, <laughs> the uh, the fitness program, mm-hmm. the trust and connection and I would even say love for one another by both within the individual boxes or gyms and then also in the broader CrossFit community is unparalleled. And I've been talking to a lot of CrossFit box owners just in the past week or so, and many of them are finding that even though they're not able to offer classes anymore, uh, in other words, people can't come into their to their boxes, to their fitness studios, they're having retention rates of 90% plus people continuing to pay to get basically nothing mm. just for the community and the connection and the feeling that they have for each other and for their box owner. Yeah. What's interesting too, when, when I'm get, I'm just thinking back to the businesses that we had before social came around and after, you can't be lazy about this now. I think you could be a bit more lazy about it years ago if you wanted to be, because people didn't have the community options they have now everywhere, right? On all the social platforms and everywhere. Yeah. So you really, all of you listening, like if you're going to do this, you can't be lazy because you like, like, I love what you said. You just can't put up like a, a group and throw everyone in there <laughs> and just think that's going to be a value add. It's not. In fact, it could take your whole program down if it's not managed and curated and nurtured. But man, if if you get that done right, like you said, people will not leave because of that community. I do think because of the social, what's interesting over the last several years is there's so much of everyone everywhere. When you do come out and make something specific for a certain type of person or business or niche or hobby or demand or whatever it is, it's going to be more useful to them. That's what we've seen in what we're doing. And I'm curious on your end too, you know, because there's so much free, there's so much stuff, there's so much noise, is niching often the way to go when you're working with clients? Yeah, absolutely. And knowing who your clients are, and, and I always have I always have my clients do a, what I call a best member exercise, especially if they're going concerned. It's much easier if, if they're, you know, you can imagine it if you're just getting started. But for those people listening who have existing customers, really figure out who are your best customers and why mm-hmm. and what, what do they have in common. So we'll even just do an exercise where we'll say, okay, just who are the best customers we have? And we'll write a list, you know, John Smith, you know, Amco, whatever, the, the company names or the people names. And then we'll say, what are the customers that we have that are fine, but not great? And we'll list those. And we'll say, what are the differences we're noticing? And we'll write up hypotheses. And that is such a good way to focus in on who your best members are. And then you can optimize your offerings around them. Mm-hmm. And it gets really niche and you find these really quirky things about who your best customers are. But the more focused you are on solving their problem, solving the problem for a real person on an ongoing basis, the more likely they are to stay because you're actually focused on them. If, if you try to be pretty good for everybody, you're probably going to be not that great for everybody. Yeah. So it's better. And, and people, this is the question people often ask me. It's like, I have this offering, whatever it is, coaching, you know, clothing, soap, whatever. And it's, anybody could enjoy it. It's good for anybody. And then you say, well, who's buying it now? Oh, well, mostly young moms, because when they have children, they decide they want to go organic or whatever the reason is. You say, okay, those are people that you're acquiring more rapidly because they're looking for a solution and they have a reason to, to shift and they have very unique concerns and needs. Mm-hmm. Focus there first, you know, and optimize for them, make the packaging good for them, make the support good for them, make the community good for them. And then if you want to add a different group, add a different group. And when you can add the features both in the product and around the marketing that are going to make that group feel fully engaged. So so Amazon did a great job of this, right? We sometimes forget that they started as a purveyor of books mm-hmm. and that was all they did, mm-hmm. right? If you didn't like to read, 
you didn't know about or care about Amazon, but their vision was always, we're going to be the best and easiest place for consumers to buy anything Mm -hmm. in the most friction free way. That's their forever promise. But they started by saying, let's do it first for people who love books. Yeah, if they, you're and right. If we'll, they had started trying to do everything, it would have never taken off. Right, because the stuff wouldn't have been, you know, delivered on time. They wouldn't have. Had, they didn't figure mm-hmm. out like how you handle returns and for for clothing is crazy compared to books. All of that stuff. So they started and they said, "We're going to nail this one thing. It's a problem that book lovers have that you know the book you want's not in stock, and then we'll we'll just expand over time based on what we learn." Yeah, when you look at the future for subscriptions and memberships and all this, you know, where, where do you think it's, it's going to go? Are you going to see this peak or is it going to just increase because it's, it's relatively a simple business model? What's your predictions? So I think it's become part of the toolbox for business. It's an option, you know, the same way, like if you said, what's the future of e-commerce, is it going to go away? No, it's not going to go away, but people are getting more sophisticated. And a lot of the early players have disappeared and it's a little more settled. And every business knows that they need to have an e-commerce mm-hmm. channel. That's just kind of table stakes. I think that's what's happening with subscription. But it's, I guess it's like like email too. You know, email is a tactic. You can use it for any number of things. Most businesses use email every day, but for different goals. So if you're thinking about building a subscription business, you want to think about what it can do for your business model? Is this a way to stay connected with your existing customers in between big transactions? Like let's say if you owned a car dealership, right? You only People may only come and buy something from you every five or 10 years. So what do you do in between? Mm-hmm. Or is it going to be an actual source of revenue for you? So back to the car dealer, maybe it's making a fleet of cars available to subscribers so that like Porsche is doing yeah. this right now where, you know, they say, what do they say? Like Monday, it's a Cayenne and a Friday, it's a 911, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. sports car on the weekend, you know, SUV for during the week. And this idea of subscribing to the to the fleet of cars. So you can you can use a subscription in many different ways. It's not going away. And then you asked what's on the horizon. You know, the things that I'm seeing is number one, this is a global phenomenon. Five years ago when I wrote the membership economy, this was mostly happening in the U.S., But now U.S.-based companies have expanded their footprint globally, like um, Netflix has a mobile only, I think, $3 a month app in India. Oh, wow. Yeah. I mean, so they're, you know, it is truly a a global service, Amazon too. And then there are lots of entrepreneurs in those countries that are developing models both for their own country and to export to us, like Spotify, which is a Swedish company. So that's one thing. And then also the subscription or the, the membership of things. So you could subscribe to your refrigerator and your refrigerator will tell you what you need to order or go ahead and order products for you. Um, Or, you know, we were talking about, you know, Peloton subscribing to your bike. What a crazy idea. So that's those are two things that I see on the horizon. I'm terrified more than anything of the fact I just realized we probably will be talking to our fridge and it will be listening to us within three years. (laughs) Probably sooner, probably, you know, Amazon's uh, vision is, you know, that you think of something you want. I say, Allie, that's such a cute blouse. I wish I had one like that. There's a chip in your brain that orders it, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think about it and it's ordered Yeah, and then it's in my closet and I say, oh, it looks terrible on me. Boom. It's gone. I'm still, yeah, I'm still getting, we don't have an Alexa, but I was just, it was funny just like, like like last week we're here in Arizona and things aren't as uh, crazy in Arizona. There is a country. So about like a, you know, a week or two ago, I went in for a little waxing and uh, suddenly the, the gal doing it starts talking to her Alexa. And I'm like, we've been listened to like this entire time. It's so <laughs> There's creepy. an Alexa in your waxing studio, your private <laughs> studio here. Like, like so, yeah. I, but you're right. Like that's just when you're thinking of new business ideas, think of all these trends and how they're going to connect. So that's interesting what you just said. Like, I'm just still stuck on, oh my God, we're being listened to. You're like, you're going to have a brain synapse <laughs> and then suddenly you'll have the shoes at your door. Like it's, we're not that far off. And I think what's interesting about everything happening right now is you see how the disruption has rushed the innovation, right? Like it is completely shortcut. Like we're so close to it now, closer than we realized I think by all being locked in our homes, like how soon this is all coming. And I'm not going to, we could do a whole show on that and look at the trends and what's going to be happening. But subscriptions have been here. They're not going to go away. That's great news for all of us. Tell us more about the new book and and then we'll, I'll ask my final question. Yeah. So the new book comes out, you know, spring of 2020 
and is really, it's really for the practitioner in the trenches. If you're thinking about a subscription business or reinventing your business, this book is for you. It's designed, whether you're starting out, you know, either inside a big company or on your own, or if you're at the point where you're like, well, we have this little subscription business and it's working, but it's all being done with chewing gum and, and paper clips being held together. Mm -hmm. And we want to actually create a real infrastructure and a real culture and metrics and pricing. And then, you know, how to continue to iterate, to stay relevant into the future. That's really what, what my goal was with the forever transaction. Great. And we can buy that on Amazon, probably by thinking about it. <laughs> yeah. It's probably in your mailbox right now. <laughs> <laughs> because we've spoken oh. it. Something's listening to me right now and we've already ordered the book. <laughs> so to, to wrap up, Robbie, can you share three of your best pieces of advice for all the women listening? And these can be just from your personal achievements and everything you know, you've know you learned and who you've become along the way, or it can be related to the forever transaction. Yeah. So with regard to the forever transaction, for those of you who are thinking about maybe this is a model that we should consider, I would say, number one, take a step back and focus on what your customers forever need is. What is that promise you can make them that will justify recurring revenue forever? Second thing is start small. So don't worry about like, we have to get it all right the first time. Be willing to just start small with a little experiment and start now. There has never been, a, the subscription businesses right now in this time of crisis, in this time of disruption, are outperforming the transactional businesses, mm -hmm. you know, in ways that make so much sense, but are also shocking if you're an investor. Subscription businesses enjoy, you know, on the average 7x valuations of non-subscription businesses. So, and in times, in difficult times, people hang on to the memberships and subscriptions that have meaning and that have relationships behind them. Mm. Mm -hmm. That will never go out of style. That never goes out of style. Wonderful. Thank you, Robbie. I so appreciate your time today. Good luck with the book. We'll all be buying it, The Forever Transaction. <laughs> and how can we keep in touch? Where where should everyone follow you? I am easy to find. You can find me at RobbieKelmanBaxter.com. You can find me, as you mentioned, on LinkedIn. You can find me on Instagram, Robbie Bax, on Twitter is Robbie Bax, and of course, in your local bookstore and on Amazon. Fantastic. All right. Thanks, Robbie. Thanks for having me, Allie. Bye. Bye. Thank you for joining me for this episode of Glambition Radio. If you enjoyed the show, make sure you subscribe so you automatically get new shows every week. And I'd love if you left us a review. We are on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, and other platforms. And I'd love to hear from you. Come join the conversation online. You'll mostly find me on Instagram, but also on Facebook, Twitter, and more. Just head to AllieBrown.com. You will find them all there. And you can also learn about upcoming opportunities to meet in person. Glambition Radio is the elevated conversation for women leaders, and I'm honored you've tuned in. Thank you.